Hello everybody and welcome to the official relaunch of EISF to GISF, so from the European Interagency Security Forum to the Global Interagency Security Forum. It's been really lovely to see how many people have registered and have joined us for this event. Um, and such a variety of people and it's um, it's taken me back a bit as it sort of spanned my career in security risk management in the humanitarian sector as we have with us um, the first NGO security professional I dealt with in Afghanistan in 2002 all the way through to one of our newest um, members who I had the pleasure of teaching at Lille University as part of their master's program so a wide variety of people and very happy to welcome you all here um, to this launch event. Um, and I think it's, it's this network of people that has enabled EISF to be what we are today. Um, we've got representatives here who joined us from um, the UN, the police, governments, academia, as well as both national and international staff from our member organizations and i think because we have such a wide selection of people with such a breadth and depth of knowledge that eisf has managed to become the center of excellence that it is and as we go global and we increase that pool of expertise we can work with um, i'm really excited in the hope that we go from strength to strength um, one of the aims of EISF has always been to work with many different types of organisations and our membership now includes humanitarian development, human rights based organisations, academic institutes and I think by working with these varieties we really hope that um, the good practice resources we develop are effective and appropriate for the sector as a whole. Um, if we can help organisations to be more confident in the way they understand and manage their security risks, then they're going to be better able to keep all of their staff and their programmes safe and therefore really concentrate on the primary objective, which is to provide support to the most vulnerable populations in need. Um, and I hope we play a part in achieving that because at the end of the day, I think that's why we're all here. So again, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, obviously, when we planned this launch, we had anticipated that we would be able to carry out a couple of live events. Um, in current circumstances, that's not feasible. So we have, instead of enticing you in with Free one nibbles, try to put together a, um, a panel of interesting speakers who will bring in different perspectives. Um, we have tried to make the event interactive, even though it's virtual. So I hope you will join in with the discussions and add your comments and questions to the chat facility. Um, before we start, I would like to premiere a short video um, that tells the story of how we have um, got to where we are today. The people doing the world's most important work are up against the biggest challenges. Since the 90s, security incidents involving NGOs have increased as their independence and impartiality no longer protect them. Humanitarians are actively targeted, as well as exposed to the risks of conflict and disaster, facing kidnapping, injury, and death in order to help those in need. And the threats to their safety means their ability to help diminishes too. NGOs began to create roles for dedicated security professionals, but they often lacked support and resources and worked in isolation. 
In 2006, a group of them from the UK and Ireland got together to develop coherent approaches to security risk management in the humanitarian space, eventually becoming an established network, the European Interagency Security Forum. With a strategic, inclusive and collaborative focus, the forum has created a center of excellence, facilitates a peer-to-peer -peer network, builds capacity for security risk management and provides a voice for practitioners reaching over a hundred members. In response to growing demand, it has now gone global, bringing different perspectives, expertise and resources to make core activities such as original research, trainings, workshops and knowledge sharing more impactful than ever. As a result, organizations are able to build their security risk management on an even stronger foundation to keep more aid workers safe and enable sustainable access to communities in need. With a vision to see the work of the whole third sector done more effectively by supporting NGOs around the world, we are the Global Interagency Security Forum. Um, great. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, and so just before we move on to our first keynote speaker, just to remind you, if you do have comments um, or questions, do put them in the chat. If you are into your social media, do tweet using the hashtag EISF to GISF. Um, and I think Tara mentioned at the beginning that uh, there will be a Mentimeter poll at the end um, and should have shared with you the, uh, the address for the app. Yeah, it's on your screen and the access code for that. We will ask you to turn your videos off when we're in the main room, just to make it easier. But we ask you to turn them back on when you go into the breakout rooms that we'll have um, in order to sort of facilitate the discussions as we go along. Um, and finally, at the end, we would like to take a photograph of everyone attending. So if you're willing, we will ask you to turn your videos um, back on at the end so we can take a screenshot for posterity. OK, so I would like to introduce our first speaker. Um, it's the former US ambassador, Bonnie Jenkins. She is the founder and executive director of Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security. And she is also a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. I'm very happy to have her here today giving our keynote address. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's really great to be a part of uh, this discussion and this launch. Uh, and I wanna congratulate you for um, becoming global and turning EISF to GISF. So uh, congratulations on that. Uh, and I think that this expansion is really a recognition of the important work that's being done uh, and that this work really needs to be global and, um, and also looking uh, and taking care of all the great humani humanitarian workers around the world and trying to ensure their safety. So congratulations on that. Um, and for my short time that I have to speak with you, I just wanted to give some food for thought for the morning's discussion. And I'll say a bit about uh, issues of inclusivity and in its manifestations and an incredible work that you do. Um, look at some ways in which uh, we define security today and how that might impact some of the work. Um, and also some, uh, some thoughts about some of the humanitarian challenges that we're all facing right now, particularly in light of what we're dealing with in terms of the pandemic. Um, I appreciate the recognition by GHSF of the many aspects of diversity that exists. And I note that, uh, that, it rec that you recognize that there are different staff that face different risks based on diversity of their profiles, their context, and their role in the, or in the organization. Um, and that, of course, as we address uh, humanitarian issues around the world, as you're all aware, you work in many different parts of the world with people with many different backgrounds. And as I read, Oxfam alone has over 100,000 staff who are working in over 90 countries. So there is definitely a diversity of people who are being serviced and also diversity in the organizations that are part of, of GISF and their diverse missions, their values, outfits, objectives, of their programs and of their activities. 
Um, but we must also look at the importance of diversity of race, ethnicity, gender uh, in the humanitarian workforce uh, itself. For example, as you know, a great deal of humanitarian work does take place um, in, in countries where there are people of color. And increasing the representation of diverse people within the humanitarian organizations themselves really reflects the recognition that having people involved in humanitarian work understand the culture and the sensitivities of some of the people who are on the ground and is extremely important. My organization promotes having diversity and in my, my context for women of color in areas of peace and security and we recognize that their roles as workers and role models are important for engaging women around the world as well as for discourse and lessons learned. In addition, having that diversity also helps to improve efforts in developing trainings and research. Products of all types can be improved if there are different voices, perspectives, and cultures, particularly from those who are most vulnerable. We are not just talking about diversity, we're talking about inclusivity. And inclu inclusivity, in my view, really equals strength. It is important to make people feel as if they are part of organizations and the work that is taking place, particularly for those who are representing those who are most vulnerable. And by becoming GISF, you are taking steps to become more diverse and inclusive. And also importantly, you must continue to increase efforts to have a staff that's diverse in race, gender, sexual orientation, and in other ways as well. Let's move on to uh, what I wanna say about redefining national security. And my organization focuses on uh, an initiative called Redefining National Security. And the way we look at it is three ways. One is already reflected in the comments made today in a way that your organization has uh, different parts that look at different areas of humanitarian work. And in our work in my organization, we look at the different issues of peace and security and how they connect and how we should be defining security uh, based on how uh, we make connections amongst the different areas of peace and security. We also look at who's at the table and who's discussing and making decisions about peace and security policy and how that also affects how we define security and also understanding the ways in which domestic and international issues connect. An important part of redefining, uh, redefining national security and security overall is how it's seen from the different lenses by different people. And spaces where humanitarian work is done is often felt by victims whose security has, has been negatively, negatively impacted in many ways. And their vision of security at that moment and normally prior to that moment may not be what the government, for example, may define as security. And it's important to understand that one's perception of security impacts one's actions and expectations of what will be done to address those threats. It is helpful as we work with different cultures and cultures within cultures to respect those different perceptions and understand those different perceptions of threats. And the concept of improving lives and reducing suffering is more than just physical, it's also cultural and gendered as well. And as we see the inevitable increase in global challenges such as infectious disease and climate change and the resulting humanitarian crises that follow, we would need to be increasingly understanding of the different ways people see threats to their own existence. In terms of what is the current geopolitical climate and where does security fit today, obviously right now the focus is on infectious disease, COVID-19 pandemic, which is a global challenge. It's shining a light on the different gaps that exist both domestic and internationally on many, many levels. It's also a harbinger of our future. And we will have to learn how to deal with global threats that create humanitarian challenges that impact the global geo -global, geo geopolitical climate in which humanitarians work. However, learning how to address the challenges humanitarians aid in this new environment where there are limits on travel and in working directly on the ground will require innovation. I read a really good article recently titled, What are the opportunities for COVID-19 that create for the humanitarian space? And it talked about bringing in international support after disasters like COVID-19, create difficulties with travel restrictions and create risks to staff infecting local communities with the new virus and also affects supply chain and the ability to procure and deliver medical supplies 
in response to a disaster. This is something that I'm sure a lot of your organizations are thinking about or dealing with right now. But at the same time, the paper highlights that there are also opportunities presented by this type of challenge to humanitarian aid um, in light of this new environment. The article noted that it's an opportunity for the humanitarian sector to advance its localization communities and commitments, including expanding national partnerships and uh, national base work that's going on and supporting systems that better engage national staff and resources. It also reduced the burden on local systems that are less likely to be overwhelmed by international support. However, it will create challenges for humanitarian organizations that have not had and not have developed strong local connections. Um, and this will be challenging to their systems. And so it's an opportunity to be innovative and to think about how to better prepare for these type of challenges in the future, because we will be dealing with things like infectious diseases uh, in the future, as well as issues related to climate change. And are there opportunities for agencies and organizations to work together on ways to respond and provide humanitarian assistance in the future? There needs to be better ways to figure out how to support and new, and new ways to institutionalize support when you have challenges enabled in your ability to actually go out and provide direct support to countries. Um, and what are the new restrictions? So the issue now is how do you adjust and how do you deal with the post COV-19 environment and what opportunities there are? And as I said, these are opportunities for innovation, but it's also opportunities and the need to bring in diverse voices, uh, to be more inclusive in how we deal with these issues, and also to be innovative in how you develop trainings and research for how to protect your staff. So these are just a few things I've given you for thought. I think I stayed within my time frame. Um, I'm going to be uh, listening and enjoying the conversations that uh, continue to this morning. Uh, and I really do want to thank once again uh, the organizers for inviting me just to say a few words. So thank you again. Thank you very much, Bonnie. Um, you've definitely give us th given us things to think about there. Um, and so I would like to uh, now send you back into the breakout rooms. These are sort of selected randomly for four to five people um, or five to six people and an opportunity to discuss some of these issues. And perhaps as a starting point to think about how as a sector, can we ensure security risk management is more inclusive and really reflects the diversity of those we are trying to support. Um, sorry, one thing I forgot to mention earlier, we are recording the event, but only the plenary sections. We're not recording the breakout rooms. So please feel free to say what you need to say and turn your cameras back on as you go into the breakout rooms. We'll see you again shortly. So now I'd like to introduce two other speakers to join us. Um, the first is Steve Dennis. Um, Steve has been a field-based humanitarian aid worker since 2002. He is probably best known for the court case um, with NRC, where they were found grossly negligent in their duty of care towards staff. Currently, he is working as a consultant supporting the aid sector. And the other speaker who's going to join us is Frederick Paulson. He is currently the Global Head of Safety, Risk and Compliance with the Danish Refugee Council. And we're very lucky that he is also the chair of the GISF steering group. Um, so I'd just like to hand over to Steve to introduce himself. Thank you, uh, Lisa. Um, since 2002, I've worked on or run projects in remote and high-risk environments uh, for MSF, other NGOs, and UN agencies. Uh, for me, the reoccurring theme throughout that time has always been the tension between the dire need to go, but the necessity to do things safely. I'm uh, very happy to be part of this conversation today with uh, GISF and um, to break that down a little bit more in the upcoming uh, section. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Frederick? Yes, thank you. Um, as you said, I, I, um, I work in Copenhagen uh, for Danish Refugee Council uh, and um, with um, the work that I do, I have, um, I have responsibility over the, the security unit and the code of conduct unit and the risk management and legal compliance. 
Um, and before I worked in HQ, I worked for many years in the field, um, mainly as country director, implementing mine action programs, everything from Afghanistan to, um, to Sudan, where I always or often their first hand experienced um, security um, risk and, and, and uh, risk management and, and often the lack of thereof. Trying to have an evacuation plan in Afghanistan was something that we had never heard of. And coming to HQ for years, I've been fighting for security risk management to have a place in, uh, in senior management and not only during crisis. And, uh, and, and with DRC, I finally achieved it uh, sitting in the, in the management group. Uh, when I started in 2010, in this role, building, building the structure in DRC, uh, we had only one security advisor in the field, and that was in Somalia. Um, now we have at least one in every country, uh, allowing us to be both risk takers and, uh, and risk adverse when, when called for. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Frederick. Um, Bonnie is also going to join us again on the panel. And while I'll start with a question myself, um, we will have an opportunity for others um, to ask questions if you put them in the chat. Well, those we have time for, we will put through to the panel. Um, the question I'd like to start with really is why do you think security risk management is important to the aid sector? Steve. Uh, thank you, Lisa. I think ultimately uh, appropriate security risk management uh, is important so that we can stay and deliver in high risk environments. Um, it can be framed as the duty of an employer uh, to care for the employees uh, to guard against uh, foreseeable risks. Uh, in the higher risk context where humanitarian workers go, that duty implies a corresponding heightened level of uh, appreciation and attention to prevent or, or mitigate these risks, and often these are security risks. Um, but a lot of this, it comes down to what's academically on paper and what's the reality of it. Uh, my court case uh, some years ago showed that you can't just play lip service to the comprehensive uh, security risk management requirements. On paper, NRC could show much of, of what looks like a holistic security risk management system, but when there is independent scrutiny of that uh, through the trial, um, there is uh, nothing of any real value and it clicked all the boxes of what gross negligence is and that's a heightened level of uh, neglect all the way through the organization for this. Um, but why is this important? I, I think um, with humanitarian aid there's so much uh, work out there, so many risks there that the probabilities will indicate that these risks will realize and there will be some, some injuries uh, due to that. Uh, in serious contexts, those injuries are a loss of life or a permanent disability. That's how it sometimes comes out. And through this industry has to sustain itself. So we can't, um, we can't lose good people uh, to likely preventable incidents. But also there's other contexts where it's not a life to death uh, situation, but it's rather the ability for somebody to either focus on the work that they're brought in to do or to be distracted by stress of a lack of strong commitment to security risk management. So for me, um, security risk management is all about how we can go and stay and deliver the, the important aid that we're there to do. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, Frederick, the same question. Okay. I think that uh, if I take my own organization, we, like many others, we, uh, we work in the most insecure and hostile locations and contexts around the world. Uh, there's numerous of risks that both to staff and, and to our resources uh, and these risks they cover many different areas from, from personal health and well-being to conflict and, and violent and crime. Um, and as a result it's, uh, it's an imperative for an organization to have policies and, and, and procedures in place to ensure that staff and assets are properly safeguarded. Without these safeguards, the objectives of DRC cannot be met and, uh, and the reputational damage would lead to lack of funding and, and um, in the end, no or poor support to those who, who really need to, to get the help that we are there to, 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 to give. And, and risks needs to be identified, addressed and managed and, uh, and people need to be informed 
trained and equipped, uh, understand risk governance and, and organizational risk appetite uh, in order to, to, to give informed consent of, of working in that particular environment in the first place. If an organization doesn't have security risk as an agenda item at management meetings and briefings to staff, people will start to make up their own perception of how things should be done. And in that sense, I, I've, I've seen that decentralization is a great for fast moving projects, but security governance has to be aligned from the field level to the boardrooms. And I think that security risk management, it really defines who we are as an organization. Thank you. Thanks, Frederick. Um, Bonnie, would you like to add any further thoughts to that? Uh, I think I think um, the main points have been covered. I mean, obviously, you need to have security because if you don't have the security, you won't have the people who are out there trying to deliver the services. Um, and I think, in a way, you can you can <clears throat> look at what's happening now with COVID with, with COVID nineteen, and look at the services. I mean, not the same exact. Thing, but if we understand um, what doctors are trying to do here, and if you lose the workforce, if you lose the people who are there to deliver the assistance, then you know the people who you're trying to help will not be helped. I think it's very simple um, in that way. And you know when we look at what's happening in the DRC and what's you know and the, the loss of lives there uh, with with uh, people who are trying to help the individuals there, not only do you lose the people who are trying to help, but you also, the situation cannot be improved itself. Um, and so if you lose the people who are trying in this, in that situation, as an example, um, to help contain a disease, um, you also lose the people who can make sure that doesn't get worse. And so I think there's a responsibility to make sure that people who are out there trying to help and who are out there trying to uh, relieve a situation are in fact protected and there, are, and there is security for them um, and I like the idea that it really is something that should be taken on by an entire organization and also by our government as well. Right. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, so question to you, Steve. Um, you obviously have very personal experience of what can go wrong um, when the security risks are not properly managed. How do you think the better coordination and collaboration can minimize the chances of this sort of incident happening in the future? Thank you, Lisa. Um, I think there's a couple of key points here. Uh, in my incident, um, ignoring the sound security risk management recommendations was a large part of NRC's blunder uh, in the situation. I think a collective voice on sound security recommendations by similar agencies managing similar risks could have had a stronger voice to counter the untrained managers making those security decisions. So I think a one part of better collaboration and coordination is a, a collective voice is stronger. I think secondly, um, effectively the humanitarian aid industry is, is self-regulated um, with limited accountability. Uh, how do you know if you're doing right? Uh, to give an example, in the, the our incident and the three years afterwards, 23 staff from the same organization were either killed or kidnapped in other uh, incidents. And all of these were claimed to be residual risk related, and there was no independent review of them, except for when I brought our incident to, uh, to the courts uh, to have an independent review, and they were found grossly negligent. For the other ones, it was their own uh, decision-making there. I think um, in a self-regulated industry, then the level of self-critique must be must rise significantly. Um, I think a fundamental part of that learning is to have a safe environment where you could admit where you're wrong and have professional peers help guide guide one another to critiquing weaknesses and recognizing successes on security risk management. So for me, it's two fundamental parts, uh, uh, collaboration and coordination amongst uh, agencies. Um, collectively, there's a stronger voice, but also um, being able to have a platform to discuss what does getting it right look like and how do we avoid getting it wrong? Those are two key issues. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, and a question to you, Frederick, building from the sort of that personal perspective to 
your position within the organisation. Um, what can GISF do to help you meet those responsibilities you have? Well, I, thank you, Lisa. I think I will take it from the point of, of why I, why I, I have joined uh, EISF and now GISF at, at all. Um, and and um, I, took it, I take it from, the, from my background that, that when I used to work in mine action, we were guided by something that is called IMS, International Mine Action Standards. And, and to a great extent, uh, the support that we got from Geneva Center for Humanitarian Demining, uh, another center of excellence in the mine action uh, arena, there was no equivalent in security. So when I assumed the role uh, to build a security structure for safety and security to protect staff assets and reputation, I looked for something um, so that could help me to write my first uh, security policy. And, I, and, and it was then I was introduced to, to EISF in 2010. And um, I, um, I quickly became a member and uh, to start to tap into what others had developed. And, and, and here I could also create my own network uh, very much the same as, uh, as I'd grown used to when I worked in, in my years in mine action. And uh, the reasons initially were to kickstart our own, our own security risk management system by learning from others and, and for a very open peer support that, uh, that had always existed within the group. Um, later, it has been the research material that, that, that has really helped me to create systems and to be able to advocate the function within my own organization. Uh, uh, this, uh, these publications is not just read by, by security people, they are read by, by a lot of other, a lot of, a lot of um, branches within our, within our organization. Um, the forums, they are ever so interesting, touching on, on, uh, on relevant and, and current topics. Uh, sometimes they are sensitive and, um, and where we can learn from how other organizations, uh, like, like uh, Steve Dennis, he explained the NRC, uh, what happened there. We've had people from NRC explaining what, what went wrong to uh, that, that uh, there are many lessons, of, lessons learned that they, they, they drew uh, along the way. That has been, was, I think, super for all the, all the members. Uh, I would say becoming a member of GISF is a step towards accountability and, um, and good security governance. So that's, uh, that's, that's why I think that, that it's, it's important to be a member. And um, so that's, that's it. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Frederick. Um, you say that's it. I think, think that's enough to keep us going. Um, we are quite short of time. These things always go quicker than you anticipate, but there is, I think, Two questions um, that I'd like to sort of put quickly to the panel, combining one from Mike Kroll and from David Clamp. Um, one was sort of what are the innovations that you think might you might see happening in security risk management in the next 10 years? And I think that can be linked, and this is part of what Bonnie was talking about as well, is with, with COVID-19, the localization agenda, the way we are having to change the way we're working at the moment, um, is that impacting on what you think might be the innovations um, over the next five to 10 years? Um, I don't know if one of you would like to start answering that. I, can, I, I, can. I nominate Frederick. <laughs> <laughs> Should I? Okay. Frederick, go on. Yeah, I think that it's uh, it's uh, innovation. I don't know about that, but but uh, I I know I know for sure that that it's really important that we have an organisation that is talking with each other uh, across across the various sections of where we work, so that we don't double up on resources. We have seen now in the COVID nineteen. When we want to make a simple, a simple uh, uh, sit rep for what what is going on in the various operations, then then we have different people asking pretty much the same people in the regional office and the country offices, uh, bogging down the system of, of of getting 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 the answers. I think that mm -hmm. breaking down the barriers and, and being more more holistic in our approach, uh, we've seen in in the COVID nineteen that that we have uh, the entire management team is involved in 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 it. Uh, having uh, having one CMT in HQ and then we have 40 countries. We have 40 IMTs up and running at the moment. That is something that I've never never experienced before. I think that we can we can learn a lot from this incident or this situation uh, going forward, and hopefully that will 
that will make us uh, talk better to each other. Yeah, I'll jump in, and I I, I was reluctant because I'm probably the least of the of the three of us who are experts on um, the issue of humanitarian security issues. Um, but I do I I do think that um, I I do like the word innovation. I do like the concept of trying to think about new ways to try to approach what is a new situation. I think a lot of us are not are wondering what is the new normal, not not just in humanitarian and security space, but overall. Uh, as we do this uh, virtually, <laughs> we're seeing what some of the new normal is. Um, but I think it's an opportunity to really, you know, now that you've expanded globally, because now you can have some new voices and um, increasing new voices about ways in which to approach the, uh, uh, the COVID-19 and post-COVID-19 environment. And what does that mean in terms of humanitarian assistance and in terms of security and whether you know, if there's fewer opportunities to go in country, if they're, if you're talking about a pandemic, what does that mean in terms of security? Does it mean that, you know, you have fewer people in country who have less security concerns, but what does that mean about the people who are on the ground and what you can provide for them? Um, so I think it is, it kind of forces you to kind of reassess, um, you know, the environment. I think that's a, a good thing uh, to think about it and to, you know, maybe, you know, in the structure that you have with GISF, you know, you know, what can be innovative in the way in which you bring in new voices and incorporate some new thinking about this, uh, this challenging environment that we're coming across. And it's not just infectious disease issues and the challenges there, but it's also if you have other uh, disasters, you know, we had, we have COVID-19, but you also had the tornadoes that happened in the U.S. recently. Um, so you have a combination of uh, disasters. So what does that mean in terms of, you know, how you address things now? Because not only do you have more disasters, the, 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 the severity uh, of them uh, combined together. So when you have infectious disease and you have all the things that happen with climate change and the environmental things that happen and the humanitarian responses to each one of these, you know, I think it does, it is an opportunity to think about the humanitarian space overall, but also the security side of it. Great, thank you, Bonnie. Um, we have had more questions. I would like to give you a quick chance to go back into the breakout rooms and have a chat about some of the things that we have discussed here. Um, there, Steve has been answering some of the questions in the chat. As I say, we will record all of the questions and we'll build them into a response that we'll share along with the recording of this event. Um, so if you'd like to go back out into your random chat rooms um, and think about how we can work together to really improve the, the physical and mental health of our staff. As, as time moves on, uh, really nice to see people adding stuff to the Mentimeter. I'd just like um, sort of one minute final words from our panel. Um, so perhaps if we could start with Bonnie, if you'd like to, very quick summation. Um, really just uh, congratulations on this. I think it's uh, the timing could not have been more, more perfect for uh, establishing and launching the GISF um, at a time when um, we're coming face to face with Lisa, uh, a, 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 a situation I think uh, we knew we were we didn't have the capacity, but I think we didn't realize just how much we didn't have the capacity. But I think it's a, it is an opportune time, I think, for GISF to, to reassess and think about next steps and ways forward to deal with humanitarian issues and the security of workers. Great. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, Steve. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. I, I think uh, just uh, to sum up a, a forum where peer professionals can openly uh, discuss issues with a uh, trust of um, trust of just being in a in a closed area. For me, that's uh, that's what's needed to raise the bar, and that's what we need to uh, stay operational in these challenging contexts that we try to work in. So um, I see GISF as as that forum. So thank you for that. And good luck. Great. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, and Frederick. Yes, I think that. Um this has been, been, been really, really good. Um, I think that an overarching topic that we've seen in, the, in this community is duty of care. 
So I think that in, 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 the, in, in that the amount of time that the duty of care has been discussed uh, over the years, I think that an area of interest to see if the increased focus of duty of care has actually benefited the aid sector as a whole. Uh, we talk a lot about shrinking humanitarian space and to see if, uh, if, if the consequences uh, of humanitarian organizations becoming more professional in making decisions about the security posture based on, on, on evidence uh, rather than just uh, something that, that has been made up. And, uh, and uh, has this resulted in a negative effect of humanitarian operation mm -hmm. presence? Some, some, some people they point towards that NGOs becoming less relevant and, and more risk adverse in, in trying to keep staff safe over helping people in need. Uh, if, if that is true, it's, it's truly a, a contradiction in terms. So I, I think that that is a, a topic where I think that uh, GISF can be very, very helpful in, 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 uh, in, in guiding us and, and uh, by, by us as, as professionals discussing the topic on how we can actually become more professional and at the same time helping more people. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and on that note, I would like to thank all of our speakers for joining us today. Um, and for being patient as we learn how to create a, a virtual event which is very different to what we've done in the past. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us, um, for engaging, asking questions, joining in in the chat. Um, it's been really interesting for us to see some of the comments and the questions that have been made. And I'd particularly like to thank all of the members of the Secretariat who've worked so hard to make this event happen. Um, and not only this, but also with the relaunch of the website, which if you haven't visited yet, do, do go and have a look, uh, gisf.ngo. Um, so it's been great. And I think just we had a quick look at the word cloud before, and if we can put that back up. Um, and I think the words that we saw coming out in the beginning, um, the sharing, collaboration, knowledge, I saw one that's now got much smaller, which was smart and calm, which I really liked. It's still there. And, and I think that to me is what I take away from this event is the fact that everybody here is willing to engage. It what, it's what gives me hope. And as keynote speakers have said, our opportunities to professionalize, to share, to learn from others. And this is really how we can help the sector as a whole. So thank you very much for everybody for joining us. Um, and as I said, if you would be happy to all turn your cameras on and um, we can go into gallery view and take a snapshot of everybody who's here. Um, that would be great. And uh, thank you again for joining us.